And we finally come back to the United States and uh, with uh, Dr. Easterbrook, who's a uh, professor emeritus of geology at Western Washington University, where he's conducted research on global climate change in Western North America, New Zealand, Argentina, and various continents, various other parts of the world for the past 48 years. He has written three textbooks, several other books, and about 150 papers in professional journals, and has presented 30 research papers in international meetings in 12 countries. Excuse me that I keep mentioning the joke as far as fringe scientists, because that is so much the perception, as we know, with uh, people who only watch maybe the mainstream media, because they refuse to let people know that there are numerous, numerous, numerous top scientists around the world that question the findings of the IPCC. Uh, he is a past president of the Quaternary Geology and Geology Division of the Geological Society of America, chairman of the 1977 National Geological Society of America meeting, U.S. representative to the United Nations International Geological Correlation Program, uh, an associate editor of the Geological Society of American Bulletin for 15 years. He also has extensive experience dealing with the media national media, and welcome our next speaker, Dr. Issa Brooke. Thank you. I made the mistake yesterday of uh, asserting that I've been studying global climate change for the past 15,000 years. <laughs> I suddenly realized that I may be old, but I'm not quite that old. Um, in 1998, I uh, made the outrageous prediction that we were headed for periods of global cooling, and you'll appreciate this was the year of either the first or second hottest year uh, of the century, and uh, people immediately thought I must be crazy. And they might be right about that, but the data <laughs> shows that, in fact, uh, we have begun the global cooling, which I did predict in 1998. So uh, what I'll be talking about today uh, is the geologic evidence which led me to make this uh, outrageous uh, prediction and I'll let you judge for yourself whether or not the conclusions are, are, uh, are verifiable. Uh, in 1797, Charles Lyell, who's largely regarded as the father of geology, made the statement that the present is the key to the past. In order to understand what's gone on in the past, you need to understand modern day processes. And that's a basic principle of geology. And I would uh, suggest that uh, a corollary might be that the past is the key to the future. Uh, that in order to understand present day climate changes, we need to know how climate has behaved in the past. And in order to predict where we're heading, we need to know where we've been. So what I will do is to show you where we've been and uh, at the end, I will show you uh, where I, the climate has always been constant. We've all seen these statements from uh, Gore and the press and various things, so I'll not elaborate on those, except to show you um, some real truth. This is a graph of temperature changes from the Greenland Gist II ice core, and it's based on oxygen isotope um, ratios. Uh, similar to the ones that, that Bob Carter was talking about. I'm going to show you several graphs, all of which will be temperature related. It'll be warmer at the top, colder at the bottom. They're all based on isotope uh, ratios, which have been uh, measured uh, for the Greenland ice cap and uh, serve as a, as a world standard. In this particular graph, uh, which goes back 15,000 years, uh, Notice these ups and downs. These are essentially temperatures, and uh, warmer here, colder here. And you see all this jumping around, and I want to impress upon you, on the right-hand side, the present change in, um, in temperatures during what we call modern global warming. And look at the magnitude of the changes we're talking about today, and look at the magnitude of changes that occurred between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago. So uh, I have numbered these one through 10. These are times of either significant global warming or global cooling, and I don't want to spend too much time on them. Uh, we have other things to talk about, but notice uh, in particular several 
Uh, number one here is the temperature change that brought to close the last ice age. And this was probably about uh, 15,000 years ago. And during that time, the temperature rose somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees in a century in Greenland, compared to eight tenths of one degree that we have experienced uh, for several centuries uh, since the Little Ice Age. To give you some idea of the magnitude of temperature changes that are capable by Mother Nature without any help from CO2. None of these changes involve anything with CO2 because all of these changes occurred naturally before CO2 began to rise in the atmosphere. Uh, I'll call your attention to, to a second one um, down here. This is called the Younger Dryas. It's a period of regression from uh, this big temperature bump down to uh, a, a back to the ice age, really, in a series of jumps. And then the warming at the end of the Younger Dryas, uh, which was about uh, roughly 11,500 years ago, the warming, as you see the straightness of the line, indicates it went up very rapidly in a short period of time, and that the total change of temperature at one point, as determined by the isotopes, was about 15 degrees Fahrenheit in 40 years. Consider the magnitude of these changes. Mother Nature doesn't need any help. Uh, it's perfectly capable of, of, of doing these things on its own. Uh, notice also uh, the line here, which is the present temperature. And um, as, as we go along, I'll comment on some of these things. Um, I would like to talk about, in the geologic past, those times when we've had significant temperature changes. And I will talk about, um, I've already talked about the sudden warming 15,000 years ago, the end of the Ice Age. I'll talk about what are called Dansgaard Urcher events, uh, which is rapid warming in decades. The Younger Dryas, which I've already mentioned, uh, just amazing, astonishing temperature rises in very short periods of time. Uh, a bit about the medieval warm period, a little bit about the uh, Little Ice Age, and then the historic uh, fluctuations. Uh, the Younger Dryas um, was a time of return to cold after the, the warming that ended the, the, the Ice Age. Temperatures dropped abruptly here at about 12,800 years ago, stayed that way for about 1,300 years, and then suddenly rose here. This, is, this should be centigrade, not Fahrenheit. This is eight, eight degrees centigrade, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, in about 40 years. Uh, to give you an idea of, of how rapid and how intense temperature changes can be. Now, during that time, uh, the continental ice sheets waxed and waned. Each one of these peaks right here represents a readvance of the ice. And there are nine of these. Uh, in a period uh, between about 11,700 and, and 10,000 years ago. So even during that cold period, the climate was oscillating uh, back and forth. During the uh, Holocene, which is the uh, time since the last ice age, uh, this is the modern day um, temperature. Warm is up, cold is down. This is coming out of the last ice age. From 10,000 years to about 3,000 years, the temperature was actually warmer than it is right now. And then it cooled for uh, over the, about the past 3,000 years with some ups and downs. We'll talk about these uh, little squiggles in a bit. Uh, here's the medieval warm period. Here's the little ice age, and we're right about in here. But look at most of the last 10,000 years. And the polar bears survived that. So I'm not too worried about the polar bears. I'm going to skip this one. Um, what I've done is I've calculated uh, past uh, paleo temperatures based on isotope ratios uh, in the ice core. And here is the graph over the past 5,000 years. And in the past 5,000 years, each of these red peaks here represents a warm period. And the down areas represent cold periods. There are also cold periods here, which I haven't colored. Uh, and the Little Ice Age is the prominent one here, the medieval warm period prominent here. Uh, Dark Ages, cool period, Roman warm period, and so on. And there are about uh, 10 of those, 10 warm peaks, 10 cold peaks. So there are 20 changes uh, over the, the past um, uh, 5,000 years. Here is the last 500 years. And again, the same basis, uh, the isotope ratios. And uh, what you'll see is that there is a period of warming, cooling, warming, cooling, 
back and forth, and there are discernible uh, points of identity here. For example, the Maunder Minimum, well known as the, uh, one of the deeper parts of the last uh, little ice age. The Dalton Minimum, which was about 1790 to about 1820. Uh, the cold period at 1880 to 1915, when most North American temperature record uh, cold was recorded. Um, the 1945 to uh, 77 cold period, and the ice core ends there, so we don't have data after that. The point I want to make here is that each of these blue lines here represents uh, one of the lows in this case. You could do the same thing with the red ones. And that the average time between oscillations here is, is 27 years. The medieval warm period and the little ice age uh, have long been documented with geologic evidence. And I, I hear arguments about the tree rings and what they mean and what they don't, ring, don't mean. Most geologists, when they read the uh, papers uh, by man, laughed because if you look in GeoRep, which is the uh, bibliography of publications in geology, you will find 485 papers on the medieval warm period, and you'll find 1,413 on the Little Ice Age. So the total number of papers in the geologic literature is 1,900. And we expect to believe that one curve from tree rings is going to overturn all of those 1,900 papers, and I don't think so. Um, so most geologists thought that either the trees that, that man used for his reconstructions uh, were not sensitive to climate, uh, or else uh, the data that uh, he used was, was inappropriate. Uh, just a couple of examples from the geologic record. Um, here is the famous man hockey stick with no change, essentially. Um, here's a, a reconstruction um, which is uh, based uh, primarily on um, data from uh, the, uh, the Sargasso Sea. It shows clearly the uh, medieval warm period, cool period of the Little Ice Age. Another one uh, based on removing the tree ring data by, by Lowell. Uh, medieval warm period, Little Ice Age. Here's one from, um, from Iceland just to show an example or some examples of the kinds of, of evidence that we have. So I don't want to spend any time on climate gate, uh, but we all know uh, what was done to the data. And what I want to assert here is that the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age uh, are alive and healthy, and they did, in fact, actually happen. <laughs> the modern minimum is well known uh, as a, uh, an example of what can happen during um, a, a uh, a solar change, the modern minimum, as you know, is a sunspot low. Uh, the red dots here are uh, examples of, of sunspot counts. And from about 1645 to about 1700, virtually no sunspots. And this was one of the deeper parts of the Little Ice Age, the direct connection between uh, solar variation and, um, and climate. And if we do that, uh, going back uh, about 500 years, here's the modern minimum. And the solar variation is plotted here on this axis. So the blue areas are cold periods. And so when the sunspots are, are low and, the, and the, the effect of the sun is minimal, uh, we have a cold period. There was one that preceded this, the Sporer minimum, the Dalton minimum, the late 1800s. All of these cold periods show up as a, um, a variability of, uh, of solar input uh, to the Earth's uh, climate system. And this is a remarkable graph. It shows a correlation of the, so the Southern uh, Ocean Index, which is a measure of uh, seawater temperature uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, versus solar activity, which is measured by what's called an AP magnetic index. And look how closely those are dancing together. Uh, you can't get much closer than that. So quickly to the crux of what I have to say, we can correlate glacial fluctuations with uh, temperature changes with ocean uh, temperatures over the past century uh, very well. Uh, when the uh, glaciers were receding, the climate was warming, uh, and the Pacific uh, was warm. Um, the glaciers uh, were advancing as a result of global uh, cooling. The Pacific Ocean was cool. The PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, is what I've shown down here. So there's a direct relationship between these. 
the Pacific Ocean has two modes, a warm mode uh, and, a, and a cold mode, and it switches back and forth with about a 25 to 30 year cycle. And the PDO has strong correlations with global climate. Uh, when the PDO is warm, global climates are warm, uh, and when it's cool, global climates are cool. Here's what the ocean temperatures looked like during a, 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 um, a cool period. This is the cool period from 1945 to 1977. And off in the Eastern Pacific, this is blue cold water, uh, expanding um, somewhat uh, and, and receding, not constant by any means. In 1977, there was what called the, the Great Climate Shift, uh, when the Pacific changed from the blue here, which is cold, to the red, which is warm, and we flipped into what's been called now the modern global warming from 1977 to, to 1999. Uh, in 1997, this is what it looked like. These are satellite uh, photographs, and very quickly, uh, warm in 1997, 98. It's, it flipped to cold mode in 1999 and has stayed there uh, ever since. It's still stuck in, in cold mode, and we're still there now. So, which leads us then to the possibility of uh, predicting uh, what's going to happen in the next few decades because every time that the uh, PDO has been cold or warm, it stayed in that mode for about 25 to 30 years. So we're stuck in cold for the next 30 years. If you thought last winter was bad, wait till next winter. So using that basis, I have then um, compared my projections based on what you've just seen with the, with the PDO and, uh, and climate changes with what the IPCC. This is the curve taken uh, as is from the 2000 IPCC website. Uh, and so uh, you can see the comparison. I think there are three possibilities that we're headed for. Uh, one is cooling similar to 1945, 1977, about half a degree, um, not really all that bad. Um, perhaps something similar uh, to the cold period, 1880, 1915, and uh, to uh, perhaps the Dalton minimum, which would be even colder, and which of these uh, happens it remains to, to be seen. Uh, a couple of my favorite cartoons, uh, it uh, speaks for itself, and what is it all about? It is, what is this whole climate thing all about? And I think most of you know that al already. Um, the impacts of global cooling, unfortunately, are worse than they are for global warming. The good news is that global uh, warming is over for several decades. The bad news is that it's gonna be worse than it uh, the global warming would have been because uh, twice as many people are killed by extreme cold than by extreme heat. Uh, we'll have a decrease in food production, which is already happening in various parts of the world. Uh, hardest hit will be third world countries where millions are now near the starvation level. Uh, we will have an increase in per capita energy demands as people want to keep warm and a decreased ability to cope with the population explosion, which is happening and scheduled to uh, increase the population world by 50% uh, in, the, uh, in the next uh, 40 years. So my conclusion then is that um, keep an open mind, uh, let the data speak for itself, and my hypothesis is provable, it's testable with time. So if I live long enough, I hope to see whether or not my prediction is right. Thank you. <laughs>